You're listening to Pop, The History Makers, with me, Steve Blame. So, David McAlman, welcome. We've never met. I only know you through your music, so to say. Um, Probably a good way to know me. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Well, uh, I'm an ex-TV presenter, but I see myself today and, and identify as a screenwriter, someone who tells stories. How do you uh, identify in that way through your job well i wonder if you've been keeping up with that if, if you if you're when you ask that question i wonder if you're aware of some of the posts that i've written because that's how i see myself now i think that um it's very much about storytelling uh, i think that music is one outlet but then i'm i've studied the history of art and um i found that at high school i was a natural with the sub with the subject of history and um I think when it comes to history, I'm a bit of a gossip. It's like, oh, wow, you won't believe what I found out recently. And I I, I, I like to share that stuff. And uh, yeah, I would say that I'm a storyteller. Writing for me is, in a sense, a dive into my trauma. And I mean trauma in a, in a, in a very wide context. Trauma can be the first day at school. You know, trauma can be something much uh, bigger. Um, and... In a way, it's sort of dealing with that trauma. Is writing in terms of lyrics uh, a way for you to deal with past trauma? I don't know that I bring that much trauma to the writing. <laughs> <laughs> I think that um, there was a period where writing was extraordinarily traumatising, the actual action of it and that was that had a lot to do with self-doubt and uh sitting down to write a song or sorry sitting down to write lyrics to a song I'd often really be displeased with what I was writing because of who I revered you know so if you revere Hal David for example you know it's like you know I'm just not as good as he is you know what, what am I doing I'm nothing and then it was a case um every time of taking myself to that point of that pit of despair and out of there out, out of that pit would come a lyric and I was thinking to myself I can't do this to myself year by year if I want to keep songwriting so I came up with a new um, method and so the new method is one that I've given the title real thoughts in real time some people say that it's about having a lyric book or some people say that it's like being it's, it's, it's like the D David Bowie process but uh, what I do is I um, I have my smartphone with me most of the time when I'm on the move. And really, whatever thought pops into my head, if I like the way that it sounds, if I like the way that the thought scans, I jot it into my smartphone. And then when an arrangement arrives from Sean, um, I just see which of the phrases work. And then I look for another phrase to follow and another phrase to follow from strictly from that list. It's good because it means that I don't go to that place of despair anymore, but it also means that it sounds to me as if though it was written by somebody else a lot of the time, because you could have had a great idea, you could have had a great thought twenty uh, sorry, <laughs> a great thought five years ago, but still um, synchronize it with a thought you had two weeks ago, and so all of these thoughts from different times come together, and very possibly at the moment that I jotted those thoughts down, I was traumatized. But um, that's a long-winded answer to your question. I hope that there was an answer in it. No, definitely. I, I I like the idea that you set the bar at first, you know, before you change your method, but you set the bar so high. Do you know what I mean? It's like um, not everyone sets the bar at how they... <laughs> other people set bars are a, a bit lower, lower. So this idea of being disappointed is almost always going to happen if it's sort of a hero do you see what I mean I agree um but I think that's always been the case there was a period where I didn't think that I was much of a singer and a lot of my belief in my ability to sing actually comes from um what other people say um but it wasn't until I worked with Michael Nyman that I thought well maybe I am maybe I do have an ability <laughs> But I remember saying to somebody years ago when they said, David, you should sing for a living. I said, no, I can't because I'm not Luther Vandross. And if I can't do that, why bother? <laughs> so there you go. There's another one. You know, and I aspire. To, I, I think aspiration is um, 
a really useful tool because I mean it means that you aim high and if you fall short you haven't been aiming low so yeah. if I was aiming for bad well then that would be that would be a disaster but the fact I aim for the best means that I get some proximity well, I'm really glad that you're, you're up there, that you aim for the best. Um, you mentioned Bowie just now. And mm. for me, great artists, and I consider you one because great artists connect to people through their music. Oh, and they have, they, have, they have a connection to the, through their music. Bowie connected to me when I was a, a teenager, not just through his music, but also through his being. And being um, a gay man in the 1970s, or gay kid in the 1970s, and seeing David Bowie, he sort of supplied that world where I could get out of the world where I was unhappy in and go to his world. Was there an artist for you when you were a teenager that you could look up to and say, this person is providing me the escape from my life? Do you see what I mean? Absolutely. What a great question. Um, Prince. I was at high school when Prince happened. I remember seeing this uh, really strange man um, and... I didn't know what he was, uh, racially speaking. Um, and he always seemed to be dressed outrageously and doing the most outrageous things. And uh, it was a situation where n there wasn't really any Prince music on Guyanese radio until Purple Rain happened. But lots of um, Guyanese people traveled to America, you know, migrated to America, emigrated to America. And, uh, sent back you know magazines and things so i was this, I, I i was at high school looking at the magazines that my friends who had family in america um had been sent and seeing the images of this guy like in jet and magazine and ebony magazine and soul teen magazine and then uh one afternoon um it's um it's seared into my memory i was at home in guyana in georgetown i was sitting on the floor I was darning a sock, as I did in those days. And then I heard this sound on the radio, which um, it was like being pinned to the wall. It was like, what is this incendiary thing that's happening right now? And then at the end of it, um, the uh, announcer said, and that was Prince with Let's Go Crazy. And I was like, oh, that's what he sounds like. And then shortly after that, I saw Purple Rain Prince. I, you know, I've been, it's been quoted before, but I have always said that Prince got me through high school because uh, he was different. And uh, there was, Guyana is a very Christian country um, and uh, with very strict, well, it was 1980s and 1970s, 1980s in Guyana, with very strict gender definitions and boundaries. And um, I didn't fit into them. You know, um, before I came out, people were telling me that I was gay. And, um, you know, it everything else was so straightforward, but there was something tangential about Prince. And I loved the music. And, uh, yeah, he was my first great musical hero, I would say. Do you think you may be part of the attraction, not just musically, because I completely understand that as, uh, uh, you know, in because in, Prince was such a fantastic musician, but also in terms of feeling maybe like an outsider in Absolutely. your sphere in Guyana. Absolutely. Um, and Purple Rain seemed to be very much about um, being an outsider and uh, not um making love to a woman the way that one might um my childhood um did feature uh a great deal of trauma my mother had a relationship with a very violent man after my father left uh which um shaped our geography um i never i don't say it often but the reason that my family moved to norfolk was because my mother needed to um, like get away get get as far away from this man as possible. And, you know, that was a feature of, of Purple Rain as well. And that was something that I identified with as a child who really didn't feel able to um, protect his mother. And um, so, yeah, um, then the fish out of water thing, you know, the, the minute we left Croydon to live in Norfolk, I was the only black boy in my school. Then I went to Guyana and I was the only English boy in my school. And I always felt 
like an outsider. And then um, at 13, I accepted Christ as my personal savior and became a born again Christian until I was about 21. And that a two two made me an outsider and then i came back to the united kingdom and there was so much about music and film and television and the british culture in the years the nine years that i hadn't been here that i knew nothing about and so that's never really gone away and um i'm never really sure whether i should say that i'm british or guyanese because i feel very strongly both i think that's really interesting because you you mentioned so many things there but the the identity issue in terms of whether you're British or Guyanese, the identity issue in terms of sexuality, the being the outsider, which also corresponds um, to Bowie, you know, Bowie, the alien, uh, the outsider, which is the appeal for me um, as a young kid as well, feeling like the outsider and the outsider has played an enormous role in um, in music. Do you know the story of Jean Genet? And when, when he was, yeah, well, when he was in prison and he used to get, beaten up by the prison guards, um, they, they beat him up because they found a tub of Vaseline on him, which suggested his homosexuality. So they beat him up. And he realised that this tub of Vaseline had power. And if you think about um, pop stars, they have a power through their image, what they wear, their music, their lyrics, and what they're getting across. And that is their sort of superpower, what Bowie has, what you have, um, as an artist, and I find that really empowering. So do you feel empowered as someone who has this past, and I'm going to use the word, you know, suffered in this past, um, and that you have um, a superpower because of it? This sounds a bit ridiculous in some way, but there is a sort of thread in there, I think, to pop music. Yeah, um, it's... I, I, I think that's a, re a, a really great question as well. It's very much about, um, it, you know, being a forced observer. You know, I'm not Guyanese, um, so I'm half I'm half Nigerian, but my father wasn't around, so I haven't I, I don't really know the Nigerian part of myself. Um, but I lived in my mother's country, but I wasn't of my mother's country, and so I observed from the outside, and. Um, Christianity became a, a, a security blanket whilst I was living there. But then um, the burgeoning sexuality that others noticed that I didn't, that um, meant that I was sort of uh, kept apart. And that's just continued to be a theme. And I think uh, there are lots of, uh, my, another hero of mine, James Baldwin, I mean, he had to, as a black man in America, he detected the difference between uh, the way that the culture viewed its white um, citizens and its black citizens, and he felt like an outsider. And in order to be able to comment on um, his American condition, he had to go to the most remote part of Switzerland or to Paris or to Turkey to tell his American story. And I really identify with that. So um, I think that's a really good observation you've made there. It's um and, and, and it comes back to what you were saying before about the storytelling. Um, I don't think if I had been straight and if I'd grown up um in England without the Guyanese intervention, that I would that, that, that I would be nearly as interested or as interesting or something that I think was interesting, worth saying. I mean, the reason I've I've touched on that is because when I read about you, you've talked about um people who have been very influenced uh either by your music or by your image and by someone who has um you know you have this and and i sort of the definitions are really hard today but you have this sort of and i mean this in a positive way obviously you have this femininity to you as well you have this softness and femininity and um and being uh, out there on the on on the stage at a certain period will have affected people, and in a sense, that's also you know symbolic of that power uh, that you have as an artist. What what sort of reactions have you had to you throughout your life that have been a very positive measure of your success? I met a gentleman in Wales a couple of years ago. I was there to speak about some work that I'd been doing um, in, in, in the heritage sector uh, with the Research Centre for Museums and Galleries at 
uh, University of Leicester, Professor Richard Sandell. And we created a project called Girl, Boy, Child, which was focused on the LGBT lives lived in National Trust properties. And so I went to uh, Wales to do a presentation about that at a museum's conference. And afterwards, a gentleman came up to me and spoke about his uh, son who had transitioned to a daughter and said that uh, the, the, the first he knew about it was when he had been a fan of the song Dimes Are Forever and watching it with his uh, son who transitioned. And years later, his daughter said to him, Dad, that moment when you were really enjoying Dimes Are Forever by um, David McCallum was when I felt able to make the transition. And I was quite um, overwhelmed by that. And of all of the things that one can hear, I never anticipated that I would hear that. But then um, recently I've been doing a new project at Hampton Court called Permissible Beauty, which um, came out of an idea of wanting to tell the story of Black British drag queens and, 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 and fluid gender personalities. And somebody came to me at that um installation and said thank you for being who you were in the 90s when you came out on top of the pops with your earrings and your blue lipstick and shaking your hair you know um you reached out and you um spoke to me and you made me look towards the future with personal positivity so yeah no um what, what once again very well observed <laughs> no but that's a, a, a no. Feel seen. thank you so and, and, I mean, that must be an amazing feeling that you can have such a positive impact. I've had that once because I was the only out TV presenter on uh, MTV Europe. And I remember being in Sweden in this small town uh, doing something on stage. And this young girl came up to me and said, I'm a lesbian and I've been I've had a horrible time here in this small town. And you, the only reason I didn't commit suicide was because I knew you were gay and on TV. And, and it was something that incredibly moved me but I didn't know how to react either <laughs> but it was sort of it just shows that there is a power and there certainly was a power at a certain era more than now where we're living in a probably a much more open society hopefully hopefully well at, at, at the same time I think um one of those par what, what one of those um beneficial paradoxes is that my father wasn't around my father left when I was six and I haven't seen or heard from him since which still is a disappointment but um that meant that I was raised by my mother and my older sister and that meant that I uh, was uh, enabled to see the world differently and to actually have some sense of what it was like to be in a woman in, in, in a in a world sorry to be a woman in a world um of dominant of dominant men and so I think that being in Guyana and with those strict um, gender uh, delimitations, that when I first came out, that that really that that, that really erupted in my appearance. That whole um, embrace of um, what it meant to be a woman. I mean, I, I've, I I I I think that for whatever reason, as I've gotten older, it's probably age. I've become increasingly um uh, the, the, i believe the word is cis in my appearance um but um i really wanted to honor um my mother and my sister in in in, in those first years and very interesting on the permissible beauty project when i spoke when, when i spoke interviewed some of the drag queens that i spoke with it that was the same thing it was all about the strong women in their families inspiring them to, to, to the extent that, that, that they are, were inspired. Oh, that's fascinating. When you returned from Guyana, how did you then make a progression into music? And how did you sort of also make a progression um, in terms of your confidence? Because I presume um, you came from uh, Guyana, you'd come out, you'd been in this uh, difficult society in this Christian world, um, and then you came back to, to Britain into a sort of slightly different uh, or society or very different society. And then um, you you made a progression into music. So how did that happen and how did that change you? Uh, well, um, I think that 
Guyana, it seemed like the biggest thing because we lived in Georgetown, the capital in the world then. And um, my sister converted to, to, to Christianity and then I followed her. And then I came back to the um, UK and there were so many more distractions. And an, 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 another way of looking at things, you might say that um, my view was and is that the only game in town in Guyana was Christianity. But coming back to the UK, I, 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 I felt like there was more to life. And along the way, there had been people who said, don't give up the day job, you're no singer. And then there were the people who like say, you have a lovely voice. And um, when I got to that point where it was like, actually, um, after all of these years of praying, I had this um, biblical idea in my mind that seven was the perfect number. And so after all these years of praying, seven years of praying, 13 to 20, it was like, OK, well, obviously, um, this sexuality is going nowhere. You know, I've prayed, I've importuned, I fasted, I've done my Bible studies, I've been to church, I've done service. And still I am. So um, if I am going to go to hell, as I've been taught, I'm going to have a bloody good time before I go. <laughs> and I came out and um, in coming out, that meant that the church was over. And if, you know, I, I was very aware of this new vacuum in my life that um, I needed something to uh, keep life interesting. And that was the point where I thought, well, let's see if the people who have... Um, appreciated in my singing are right and that's when I started um, looking for a band to become a part of and that was Thieves now just to just to touch on Guyana one a little bit more because the church has an important role in a sense because of gospel music and that mm -hmm. it was in Guyana that uh, you were I presume that was where you were introduced to gospel music apart from Prince and the American artists that were transported on the radio to Guyana at the time that you've already mentioned. So how, what was gospel music for you at that time? What was the, the feeling that you got from it? What was it that you really sort of uh, liked and could relate to? Uh, well, when I left here in the 70s, um, there was a it, it wasn't gospel, I suppose, so much as it was a Christian spirit here. But I'm pretty sure that when I was growing up, I don't know if my mother was listening to Radio 1, but there was a period where you'd hear um, Day by Day. Um, do, you know that, do you know that song? Yeah, I do. Oh, dear Lord, these things I pray. Surely. <laughs> and morning has broken. And then there was Christian singing at school assembly. And um, my mother had my sister and I pray gentle Jesus, meek and mild every night before we went to bed. So this Christian sensibility was already there. And then going to Guyana, that was where the, uh, that, that, that whole European folky sensibility, to himmy sensibility was stripped away for something that was much more impassioned and American. And that's where I found uh, Andre Crouch. Um, another great musical hero of mine, but I I don't speak about him that often because lots of people just don't know who he is. You know, if you speak about Prince or David Bowie, he's like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we speak about Andre Crouch, it's like, who? <laughs> and Mahalia Jackson. Oh my God, Mahalia Jackson. I mean, I just adore that, I adore that woman. Um, I was recently asked if I was going to watch the Mahalia Jackson film on Netflix. And I was like, absolutely not. <laughs> this would be like watching a film about Shirley Bassey. Nobody can play her. I'm not watching that film about Whitney. No one can be Whitney. No one could be Mahalia. And so, um, but there was also the um, contemporary Christian music, which um, attempted to sound as pop as possible by subtly inserting Jesusness into things. And that was okay. But um, the um, Black American gospel stuff was really important. But then there was also um, the sort of tambourine led, what they call choruses back in those days, where um, some about three members of the congregation would stand at the front with their tambourines and just sing um, verses of different songs, one after the other for about half an hour to kind of uh, excite um, the worship and the speaking of tongues. And I think that comes out in my music a lot as well. 
Um, another person who was looking at me um, in the early days said it was amazing to see you because you were bringing that whole gospel tambourine thing. And I think it's, I could be mistaken, but I'm not as aware of it being part of the American um, gospel as, as, as it is in Guyana. But then in Guyana, I think there's a lot more um, Africanness that hasn't been uh assimilated into americanness i think in, 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 in guyana you had uh faiths like the jordan knights and so on who were determinedly african in their worship now the band that you got into when when you came back to britain was feeds and it was your sort of first um collaboration uh mm -hmm. with saul freeman um this collaboration at one point um it ended uh, you'd been fated a lot and i just wonder whether it was a point where you learnt what you wanted from a collaboration after that do you see what i mean like sometimes we go into something and it and it works out this worked out musically it was fated in the press and you you had some success um but the collaboration itself didn't seem to work and i wonder whether that gave you an idea of what you really were looking for in a collaboration um I really value that because um, Saul enabled difference of expression. Um, he really um, taught me about the importance of not being cliched, of not sounding like everybody else. And I didn't grow up in that um, culture of um, pop Cocteau Twins and Squitty Politi and Blue Nile. Uh, these were all the acts that um, Talk Talk, the acts that Sean, sorry, that Saul really appreciated. And um, I didn't know about any of them. And so uh, with regard to being uncliched, it was enormously valuable. But then the other thing that Saul loved about these bands was that they took ages, you know, that, 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 that they really treated um, their music making like a high art form and he was enormously impressed by the idea of Hollis Brown um, taking a fortnight to perfect the, 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 the snare sound <laughs> and I was like I'm not here for that because the studio is not really my favorite place I love the stage I love performing get 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 out there do it and it's over but um, being in the studio for um for, for for months and months didn't really appeal to me, which is quite ironic when you think about this latest release and how long this has taken to make. But um yeah no it it it, it was um a good relationship and it ended because um no I, I was upset that the first album was called the McCalmont album um I, I I kind of felt like there was nothing I could do about it because it existed. But because Saul and I had decided not to work together, Saul wasn't prepared for me to call the album a Thieves record. And so it became a McCalmont record. And I wasn't happy about that because that's not me. That was us. And I was, you know, I I, I think um, that uh, Saul was trying to get it stopped altogether, maybe. But um, the, the, the record label was like, absolutely not. We paid for this, so it has to come out. And then it became a McCalmont record. And people assessed it as if though it was a record that I was responsible for when we both had worked on it together. But um, yeah, I mean, Saul brought the Cocteaus, the Jane, Jane Sibbery, the Blue Nile, Squitty Politi, Talk Talk, all of those acts were acts that Saul introduced me to. And ever since then, um, you know, even when I worked with Bernard, Saul's influence was very strong. <laughs> So we often talk about what we learn from people, but what do you think Saul learned from you? What did Bernard learn from learn from you? Because I think there's there's always another side to it. You always think one way, and actually there's always another way. So what do you think you gave Saul? I don't know. That's a really interesting question. I've never really thought about that. Because um I don't know. I mean, I you know, I got the audition. They wanted to work with me, so I suppose I um I I I, I remember hearing um Bernard saying 
um, that he really loved my voice and that he really wanted to work with it. I think um, they have a view of me as they, they had a view of me as a singer and that they felt that I was the a, a good addition to their sound. But like I said to you before, it took me years to actually um, imposter syndrome to actually think, um, are you sure? <laughs> with Saul, it was like, are you sure you want to give me this? So, 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 so sure, um, Saul interpreted that as, you know, disinterest, indifference. Uh, whereas um, Bernard was a huge star when we met and, you know, on the cover of the Melody Maker is the best new band in Britain and all of that. And uh, uh, after working with Brett, who was very fated at the time, I was like, are you sure you want to work with me? Um, so yeah, and then that, and then David Arnold was another collaborator who came along, and I was like, okay, that David worked with me because of what happened with Yes, and that was like, okay, um, I were all right, but it wasn't until I got the call from Michael Nyman that I thought, actually, this is this keeps happening, David. So there must be something that you have, something that you bring. It's time time to start believing in it. Yeah, before we move on to to Michael Nyman and come I later to High Price Shoe, yeah, <laughs> I just want to just want to talk about the track, yes, because it's cited by many as being the track of the Britpop era, and sometimes when you create a track like that or have a success like that, it's sort of the noose around the neck if you don't actually creatively develop and move away from it. How aware were you that that track? as brilliant as it is, could have been, the, you know, the track that sort of defines you for life? Um, hmm. No, I had no idea. And um, I, when I think about that now, I still have no idea what I did. In some respects, I think to myself, if I knew what I'd done, I would do it again. <laughs> because um, as time went on, you're quite right, it became the track that has defined me for life. I've stood um, on stage um, doing um, new material with um, people in front of me playing yes on their mobile phone and saying, he's this guy, it's the guy who did this. And uh, it's... Um, it's funny that you say that because I don't think it has defined you. I mean the opposite because I oh. feel like you it could have defined you is what I've said. And and I don't think it has because I think it's one of those tracks that could have been that track that stays with you forever. But you have defined yourself differently along the way. If some people in the audience think that, that's that's their their thoughts. Do you know what I mean? But yeah. you certainly haven't defined yourself by that track. No, 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 and, and no, you're you're quite right. I don't, I I don't think I have, but it has become enormously powerful. It's they've been, I mean, it's twenty five years they've been playing that song on the radio. So yes, it's been on the radio for a quarter of a century, <laughs> and I've never scaled um that height commercially again, um as something about which I have mixed feelings. But um at the time, um Judy Garland is who I thank for that. Um, is a, 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 I think it was extraordinarily fortunate. On the one hand, you had Bernard, who um, just wanted to write the happiest song he could. And, you know, his approach for that was to listen to as much Scott Walker, which confuses me a little, and Dusty Springfield as possible to hear what made it, um, what, what, what made a happy song. And then he came up with that. And that was one of the first things he said to me about it. He said, I've been listening to lots of Dusty Springfield. And I was like, well, hey, because I loved Dusty Springfield by that point. And then I um, took the song home and um, I knew that it, it, it had been um, optioned to several people before who, who had like returned it and said, I'm really not sure what to do with this. So when Bernard told me that, I was like, right, but it's not going anywhere else. And so I worked really hard on... Of, you know, for, for, for a full day, I would say, on like coming up with something interesting. And what I came up with, I was satisfied with, which is why you, the, the, the verse happens the same. And that's how I did it. It was like, I'm OK, I'm, I'm working with the guitarist who used to be in Suede and he's been listening to Dusty Springfield. And that's nice. So I'll go home and I'll, you know, try and do something um, that suits what he's given me and to impress him. And it was it, it, it really was one foot in front of the other. So so when it did what it did, I wasn't ready um it 
isn't what I was aiming for. I mean, I wouldn't even say I wanted to do well as a singer, but to me, doing well um, was more about credibility than it was about fame. And I think the fame really derailed me creatively, 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 ultimately, because um, there were lots of people who uh, responded to me as somebody who could make that happen. And it's not what I've been, it's not what I've entirely been interested in doing, like creating commercial hits. That's not what I signed up for. So it's, it's been a, what's the word? A poison chalice in some ways, you know? I mean, and, and the, the other important thing about Yes is that um, Bernard really didn't want to do anything else with me. You know, um, he wanted to make this brilliant one-off. But then the record company gets involved and we want an album. They want an album. And that was why the McCalm and Butler project went on a little longer than either of us wanted. I mean, you mentioned earlier Michael Nyman as a sort of figure where you um, at last realised your own talent, as it were. I'm going to put it that way. And um, what was it about him and the, his method of working that made you realise that? Uh, I don't know. Does this begin with Peter Greenaway? And well, I he... love Peter Greenaway films, so... Yeah. <laughs> The Cook, The Thief, His Wife and Her Lover was my first. And I saw lots of them after that. And always this incredible Baroque sound that Michael made. And then I remember going to see a film about um, the difficulty of urban life in London called Wonderland. I don't know if you've seen that. With this wonderful soundtrack and then at the end as the credits rolled it was michael nyman again and i was like wow and i've always um been a bit of a daydreamer i'd like th I, I, i'd think oh it'd be great to work with michael nyman but i'd never make the call you know i'd never think to make the call and then um so yeah i mean I, he, he was somebody i revered and I think I probably liked his music more than I liked the Greenaway films, but that's another discussion. <laughs> and then um, I got to a point where a, a frustrating career point and um, I said, what do I do? And this was the point where Facebook was um, had become a thing. And um, someone said, sign up to Facebook. And I did, and within a week of doing that, I got a message from Michael Nyman saying, hi. <laughs> I was like, hi. And um, I want, you know, I, I didn't believe it could possibly be him. Thought it was a fake but, account. <laughs> yeah, I did. And so I thought it was somebody posing as Michael Nyman. And I sent him a message saying, um, you know, to test him out, to smoke him out. And I said, I really loved your soundtrack for Wonderland. I thought that was sufficiently obscure. And I said, um, I really enjoyed the music you did for Wonderland. It's really great to meet you. And he's and, and then he sent me back an even more confusing message. He said, Well, yes, I really like that soundtrack as well. Perhaps you'd like to um, work on it with, with 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 me. And I was like, Oh dear. And so we arranged a meeting. And until I saw him for myself, I was like, is this really him? And then Michael Nyman showed up and he was like, whoa, it's really you. But yeah, no, yeah, it's he's a... Uh... But why did he Why did he say to you why he wanted to work with you? Because he contacted you. Yes. So what did he say? He's Michael. I mean, we met and um, he immediately started... You know, here's an idea, here's an idea, here's an idea. There was no, I think you're this. Uh, it was just, um, you know, okay, here we are. Let's talk about what we're going to do. And what did you talk about? Um, we spoke about canons. And then um, he, uh, we, I, I spoke about the music that I loved. And I um, said to him, which he never understood, because for... Michael, Michael invented a system to which he stuck. 
and I I I, I, th I think I've borrowed that from him as an as an approach to lyric writing. But that that, that that's a digression. He <laughs> said um, that he created a system, invented a system, a minimalist musical system. And interestingly, his fans weren't as keen on me as my fans were on him. You know, um, I think if I'm the glare did well at all, it had a lot more to do with people who like David McCallum than people who like Michael Nyman. Because Michael Nyman fans are fans of minimalism, and there's this soul singer doing his thing all over Michael, <laughs> my, Michael's music. But um, yeah, and we spoke about um, canons and music, and I. I pointed out to him that one of the things that I liked about his music and that made me feel like I might be able to write to it was there was something kind of Motowny about it. There's one song that we call that that we did call City of Turin that has this really um, emotionally charged moment in it, and it's a key change, and it's the key change from Sunday at Christmas by Stevie Wonder. But once again, Michael would say, "Well, no, it's it's it's, it's the system. It's my system." But then I realized when I went on tour with them that the thing that was making me hear the pop was that he assembles this um all these interesting um sounds like um he won't he, he'll use a treble uh, he'll he'll use a bass trombone rather than a trombone but that but 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 but, but you know it's it's very um the, the instrumentation is very carefully selected but then he doesn't use an acoustic bass he uses an electric bass. That's why the sound is like that. But it's an amazing sound that kind of builds to um, inevitable transcendence every time. Um, and so strenuous. Um, what is expected? I mean, these guys sweat and work so hard, and he's like at the piano, ding, 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 playing really fast and minimally, and doing the same thing repeatedly for minutes at a time. It's, it's, it, it, it's astonishing. I was just so impressed by him, and just as flabbergasted that he would come out of that, you know, very disciplined classical environment and want to work with a want want to work with David McCalmont. It was like wow. And so I felt that I needed to raise my game to work with Michael Nyman. I was so flattered by it. Um, and that's not to do all of my other collaborators down, but it's Michael Nyman. <laughs> I mean, you mentioned two songs there. One, one was about a woman who had been trafficked. And um, you actually met that woman after you performed that song. Can you tell me about that song? And tell me about that meeting and what that song meant to her after she heard it. Uh, okay. Um, well, the approach for writing the songs on the glare was um, contemporary portraiture. It's like uh, the concept was, okay, if I um, presume um, Michael's, musical settings as a canvas I, I, I can go to um press stories and write and, and, and paint portraits on them so i uh listen to the music for um what became the city of turin and actually it was taken from a movie starring nicole kidman practical magic was the name of the film and it was a soundtrack that Michael had created that didn't get used by the film. And um, the music was called Convening the Coven. And to listen to it, it sounded to me like this great coming together of people from the four corners of the earth. And so I went looking for a story that could um, live up to what, 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 what the music was, what, what, what was evoking. And I found out about um, people being trafficked from Ni 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 Nigeria to Europe and they were being trafficked. It was, it was through a um, magazine article about uh, a Nigerian people trafficking ring being broken in Seville. And I dug a little deeper and it was happening in Oslo and it was happening in Italy. And it was because uh, there were large Nigerian populations in these cities that... Um, the the practice had proliferated there. And so I was reading NGO reports and everything. 
you know, really pushing the internet as far as it could go to see what I could find out about it. And then I found Turin. And I knew about, I knew of Turin because of the shroud of Turin. I thought, okay, let's, City of Turin. There's, there, there, there's the title. And then I um, looked on the internet, um, it, look, look, looked on YouTube um, and found an interview uh, with Isoke Ike Pitanyi and wrote the song. Um, you know, kind of inserting myself into that role. How would I, you know, express myself if I, you know, one one can never really know. And the upshot of it is that if I were in that situation, maybe this is how I would, um, you know, um, emote, how I would feel about things. And then we did the song and it was my favourite song on the album. And lots of people spoke about the claw that caught in their throat when they listened to that song about the emotion of it. And... That was also yeah that 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 was the one that reminds me of the Stevie Wonder chord progression, which also has 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 that effect. The Sunday at Christmas um you know always moves me emotionally. It's more musical um emotion than that than it is what he's saying. And then somebody wrote about it. Somebody wrote about the album, and she just written a book, and it was a a, a two page feature in an Italian newspaper. And then we got invited by the city of Turin to sing at the Summer Palace. And um, I remember heading out and thinking, why hadn't I done something to um, maybe contact her? And then she showed up. And I saw this woman walking towards me and she came up to me and she said, I want to tell you who I am. And I said, oh my God, I know, I, I, I know who you are. And then before we did the performance, we we, we introduced her. And um, it was just one of those really extraordinary moments. But um, she felt heard um, in a way that she hadn't ha hadn't before. She'd um, settled in Italy, um, found herself a good man, and uh, was um, running a uh, shelter for people like her who had been similarly trafficked. So she's doing good work there and she did invite her invite me to her wedding but I couldn't make it but um yeah that's that's one of the most special things that that that, that, that has ever happened so I think that probably uh returns us to that question you asked earlier about um music having a benevolent effect I mean the, one of the songs that's really touched me is uh is the glare um and it's something that touches me and it for me it's about I know it's got a completely different story to it but maybe it is about loss of identity because for me it is about my mother passing and losing a part of my identity because she passed and it always reminds me of that and I always find it fascinating that the listener can have a different perspective on a song um, than the writer so maybe you could just tell me that story and whether it is a little bit about loss of identity. Um, I think in many respects, it, it, it it's about being thrust unexpectedly into um, the spotlight. And um, that's something that's happened to me, something I can identify with. Uh, I did want to work in music. Um, I did want to do well. Um, I didn't realize that um, my friends would change, that the whole world would act differently, and that I wouldn't be able to walk around um, in my invisible. And that, 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 that I'd lose my invisibility cloak. I didn't blend in anymore because I was that bloke who was on top of the pops, or that bloke who was on the word, or and 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 and, and so on and so on. So um, I was really struck by um, Suzanne Boyle um being a beautiful voice that um made audiences weep and with that with that moment of exposure came all of this atten a a attention that um meant that she had to um spend some time uh in recovery for her um for, for her own well-being and i thought well god I mean, I can understand exactly why that happened. And it's something that I never did. Um, so that's what it was about. 
I mean, on the other hand, the question that you ask, there are those people who don't listen to the words at all. You know, they like a song and then they discover what the words are years after they've fallen in love with it. I mean, you know, I, I speak about other people, but that's, um, you know, my great love is the Bee Gees and it was years before I understood what they were saying. <laughs> But that discovery made me love them even more. And so that's the nature of the investment that I make in the lyric writing is, OK, people aren't going to listen to these words, uh, you know, for a few years. But when they do get around to hearing what it is that I'm actually saying, I want something of value to be there. But being in the spotlight, being in the glare is a loss of your identity, isn't it? Because it is giving that, you know, you walking down the street and people saying, oh, that's that guy from Top of the Pops, that's the guy from The Word is a loss of what your true identity is. It's their vision of your identity. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So, anyhow, let's get on to Hi-Fi Sean, because that's what we really should talk about now. Um, yes. <laughs> was that over Facebook or Instagram? Or was it over Twitter? How did you actually meet him? Hi-Fi um, was um, Facebook. <laughs> You're really active on Facebook. This is fantastic. <laughs> um, and uh, honestly, um, this kind of really um, interesting looking man <laughs> sort of like appeared in, in my friend notification. And I was like, oh, hello, who are you? <laughs> and I just accepted um, his friendship. It was like, oh, he's a DJ or something. And then over time, we didn't really communicate much. But uh, every now and then I would notice, guy, this, this this guy's a real fan of the Suit Dragons. He really loves Suit Dragons. And I remember the Suit Dragons from the like the late 80s when I first came back here and I first discovered the indie chart. It was like, oh, what is this indie music? And the Suit Dragons were there doing soft as your face. And it was like, huh? But um, so this went on for a while. And then one day um, I um, sort of did a Facebook um, half promotional, half shout out, looking for somebody to um, be a special guest at my show, a show that I was doing at Leicester Square Theatre for, for, for the McCalmont live record. And Sean popped up in my um, comments saying, I'll do it. And I was like, <laughs> why don't you, why don't you want to stay with me? And then I kind of took another look at his profile and I thought, oh, it's the guy from the Soup Dragons. Because, um, and uh, you know, at that, that point, I realized, my God, he's an absolute chameleon. Because there's the kind of like, you know, I go crazy, I go soft as your face. And then a few years later, it's like, I'm free to do what I want. And then suddenly there he is. He's this like, you know, hot dance DJ. And then, <laughs> and so, um, yeah, then um, we, he, he, he decided that he was going to do the album FT, got in touch, asked me if I'd be one of the singers. Um, I was amazed in that roster that um, he wanted to include me, but I was completely up for it, as was everybody else. And we did that. And then um, whilst we were doing that, I was really liking what he was doing musically and how capable he was, which is usually why I work, what, why, I, why I collaborate with others. Otherwise, I'll just sit around daydreaming. Um, and um, I was hoping that he would ask me to do an album with him. And um, one day he did ask, and I didn't want to. I didn't want to seem too desperate. <laughs> he tells this story all the time, and so I said, oh, well, "Okay, I'll think about it." But I wasn't being cool. He thinks I was just being like, you know, really kind of attitudinal. But I wasn't. I was just like, you know, okay. Well, I, I hope he means it. But let me just not, you know, jump in with both feet, so I don't want to appear too desperate. And then um, I, I, I rang up the next day, and he was really nervous because he'd been like stressing about, oh dear, I shouldn't have asked him. I've like, you know, put him off the idea. And then he um, will go, la, 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 and I was like, you know, Sean, Sean, it's okay. I'd love to do an album with you. I mean, there's obviously a deep friendship there as well. Even the way you talk about him is with such warmth and love. Um, so is this sort of really, has this become very important to you to have, be able to have this friendship connection and also be able to work with someone? Is that something with him the first time you've really had that? So close, I mean. Yeah, um, it is a friendship. Um, and... I have kind of been friends with other collaborators, but no, Sean's my friend. Sean's my mate, I would say that. Um, and I think 
the fact that we're both gay um, is also significant. Uh, I think that um, working um, as a lyricist and as a singer with um, people who aren't, and this is not a slight on them, has been quite forbidding in some ways. It's like, can I go here with you? Can I express this part of myself this openly with you? And um, working with Sean, I found that actually, yes, I was actually putting limitations on myself, whereas with Sean, I feel able to be quite free. What about um, musically? What do you feel you both add to the mix and how do you actually apply that? How do you actually work together? Um, one of the things I've always been very concerned about with records is the groove. And I've spent a lot of time listening to records thinking, is is this groove quite right? Have we got the rhythm right? Um, if I don't think about it, can the groove still carry me along? And with and, and with Sean, that's instantaneous. Um, I love the fact that he's a chameleon and that he's like been all these different incarnations on the way to becoming um, an electronicist, as it were. And um, he loves a big noise. Um, and I seem to attract people who like to make a big orchestral noise and 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 Sean's no different. Um, I also um, think that left to my own devices, I can slip into maudlin and balladeer into a into a maudlin balladeer. Um, whereas um, sh working with Sean, that, that, that that's not going to be allowed to happen. But he. Um, Sean used to be a singer, and that's not something that he um, feels like doing anymore. So um, he's quite glad to um, have a singer around <laughs> to um, do the material. And um, have I answered the question there? Yeah, ab absolutely. So this album is called um, Happy Ending. And of course, I talked to Hi-Fi Sean about that. And Happy Ending has a number of connotations. <laughs> what connotation has it got for you? Um, it came out of, um, I, 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 I had a thought once and it was, um, good outcomes and happy endings. That would, wouldn't it, would, wouldn't it just be nice if we lived in a world of, of good outcomes and happy endings? That's not really, so I jotted it, in, jotted it into my smartphone and then we'd written something completely different on, um, that song. And then I suddenly felt, um, I think it might have been Christmas 2017 or Christmas 2016. I suddenly felt I could do better. And so I went back to the smartphone and started writing something a bit more melodic. Significantly at the time, I was um, listening to Theme from the Deep by Donna Summer and John Barry and really loving that whole ethereal thing that they were doing there and wanting to write something that was more that was more flavoured like that. And so we created something new and um, the punchline was good outcomes and happy endings are scribbled in my heart. And then when it came to tightening the album, Sean quite liked the joke <laughs> to which you just alluded, <laughs> calling something happy ending. But no, that's not what I was thinking. <laughs> I mean, it has some amazing tracks on there because um, the skin that I'm in was one of the most, it's a very moving track and obviously a very deep political message on that track how um well, tell me why you want you to write that maybe that's a better question um well um the skin i'm in is actually quite different to the, to, to, to the way the other songs on the album were written so that, 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 that that's well observed but um the music that i got from sean for the skin i'm in reminded me of uh what's going on and so the arrangement sounded political it also sounded um, quite uh, mournful, you know, um, which is not to say that it sounded like a dirge, but it sounded very melancholy. Uh, so melancholy and political reminded me of what's going on. And so I need, so I thought I needed to write a political subject. And then um, I was a bit of a Trump watcher and commentator. I write blogs on my Facebook page. And um, one piece that I'd, that I'd written was um, the moment that, that, that they refer to as the theater of fascism. 
because uh, all the time that Trump was on the rise and people were saying that this man is is what he is, I was like, yes, but what does that look like? Okay, he gets he 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 gets elected. What is this moment of fascism that everyone is warning us about? And to me, that happened when the Black Lives Matter protests were raging um, in the streets of Washington, and um, I call it the animal farm moment when the um, Trump and, and and this retinue emerged from the White House to walk through the streets where the um, protesters had been gassed and beaten off by the police so that he could stand up with a Bible. I thought, oh, that's it. That's the moment. That's the moment where it becomes manifest that this bloke is what they say he is. So I um, wrote uh, some paragraphs about that on my Facebook page. And then when I, and shortly after that, Sean sent me the music and I just uh I gleaned harvested some of the words from that piece that i wrote a long piece that i wrote and put them onto happy ending so put them onto the skin i'm in i heard um an interview with you talking about um the recording process or when you're in the studio with sean and he lives in a high rise um i'm not sure if it's in hackney or it's all in that area of london in any case um and um that it's a very comfortable place uh, for you unusually because you said before that you're not particularly comfortable in that sort of studio atmosphere so what why is that comfortable what is different about it well um it's just me and sean and um in the past particularly in the major label years you know it's an engineer but you don't necessarily know and the producer and an assistant and um no windows no daylight, air conditioning, <laughs> the list just goes on, you know, um, too much tea, too much takeaway food. Whereas, no, I thought his uh, husband came home and cooked. So, yeah, his husband comes home and cooks every night. That's what I heard. Yeah, yeah <laughs> and, and, and every, every Thursday was steak night. <laughs> God bless Mike. <laughs> and, uh, you, you know, there was Barney and Fred, the two dogs. You can see Fred's face in the sun at the end of the beautiful video. And um, this 180 degree um, panorama of London on the 18th floor. And so um, it was, um, we we jokingly referred to it as the Tower of Song. But yeah, it, it, it wasn't um, being um, in a studio at all. It was being with my friend making music. Occasionally, with the neighbors downstairs banging on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> you you mentioned earlier that one of the most comfortable places for you is being where you're really at home is being on stage. So, what are the plans with Sean to go and take this record out on stage and perform live? Well, it's a conversation we're having at the moment because we have started the second album. Um, we have one album, which is, uh, I don't know if that's enough songs. No, it's not enough songs for a live show. So um, we're hoping to get the second album out quickly and then we'll have enough material. Um, at the moment, we're doing a small show at The Third Man the day before the release of the album. But that's really, really a small show. It's a small place that's um, under a record shop in Carnaby Street just to kind of um, launch the record. But um, I would hope that by the end of the year we'll be announcing tour dates because I really do want to do this music live. But at the same time, I'm conscious that if we do it live, the audience won't get much bang for their buck. We one might of the have a support, though. One of the interesting things is when I when I talked to Sean was that because he's had such a very I'm going to say varied life. I mean, he's he's gone through so many things in his life and. And uh, and as you mentioned, this sort of transformation throughout his life um, that you do feel he has had a happy end. <laughs> you know, he's having a happy ending and not that it's the ending of some side, but he's having, you know, the, the later part of life. And I'm older than both of you, so I'm allowed to say that is a <laughs> happy ending. The um, Do you feel like you're having now your happy ending? Yes, yes, I, 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 I do. Um the great disquiet I had was uh, not finishing my first degree. And I beat myself up about it for years. And then in 2012, I went back to university to study the history of art and I completed. 
And uh, that means that now I am at the Architectural Association in London as a, a as a tutor. It also means that I'm doing fantastic collaborative um, pieces of work like the Permissible Beauty installation that's on at Hampton Court right now. And um, it, 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 it means that when uh, in between the music, as it were, in, in between the promo and so on, but, but, but actually I've got a going concern, which is um, studying and teaching the history of art. And that makes a, an, an enormous difference. Though I will say that I studied um, the history of art because I wanted to ensure inspiration. But I, but I, I had an inkling that if I studied the right subject, that inspiration wouldn't be a problem. And that's that, that, that's turned out to be um, true. I think a lot of time is spent on keeping our keeping our instruments and our voices in good nick and um, maybe the exercise of songwriting. But I don't think that we give enough time to um, making sure that our inspiration reserves are maintained. And I think that studying a subject like the history of art has kind of set me up for life, really. Well, David McGowan, I want to thank you for your contribution to music and your beautiful voice. I mean, which is really a stunning um, voice. And I wish you much, much success with uh, Hi-Fi Sean. And I'm really glad that we're all having a happy ending together. Thank you. Thank you. It's been such a lovely conversation. I really appreciated um, your knowledge and uh, the, the questions that you asked. So thank you. Up there is an interview I recommend. Down there is where you can find all the podcast interviews and here is where you can connect.